Good morning. It is so good to see all of you here today. Everybody have a nice Easter? Amen. Good, good. Um, feels like it's been a busy morning. Um, I don't know why. It's just a typical Sunday. But as a typical Sunday, it is a joy and a privilege to be here in God's house, to gather together, whether we are present or whether we are online. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. I have a few announcements this morning. Uh, actually, several. Uh, the second mile giving this month will be Hannah's Hope, which is a local organization that uh, provides developmental equipment uh, for kids with special needs, and it connects families um, to make life and to have a community uh, for those families. Today, following a fellowship time, which will be across the hall in the parlor, there will be a worship committee meeting. Um, we've been trying for a number of months at First Church to have semi-regular worship committee meetings. Uh, today, I really hope that we have uh, people from both churches participate in that. Um, since we worship together, we need to plan worship together. On April 11th, uh, the community preschool and child care will be having kids bingo night from 5.30 to 6.30 at Woodmar. Uh, April 14th, next Sunday, is Confirmation Sunday. Uh, I hope that you will all come out to uh, support our youth as they take this next step on their faith journey. And there will be a reception following worship next week in the parlor for the confirmands. Also on April 14th uh, will be a rummage sale planning meeting at 1130 in room A, which is the room right over here. And uh, in the sanctuary here on April 14th will be a town hall meeting for the Woodmar congregation as an opportunity for you all to uh, ask me questions and for me to give you a sense of the direction that uh, I intend to lead. So for all the Woodmar people, I hope that you uh, come to participate in that. April 20th, um, which is Saturday, at Church of the Four Seasons in Winfield, Indiana, from 2 to 5 p.m. will be a uh, learning event put on by our North District called Learning to Lead Like Jesus to Transform Your Church. We are hoping... Uh, to meet the challenge given to us by our conference superintendent, Reverend Dr. Marty Lundy, to have five, at least five people from each church to attend that. Um, and uh, we will be arranging carpools. So if you would like to carpool, contact Brenda and she can help to uh, put those names together so we can arrange for people to drive. On April 21st, uh, following a fellowship, there will be a messy church planning meeting. Messy church is a way of doing church that reaches out to people who would not feel comfortable coming to a regular Sunday morning worship service. And um, if you'd like to know more about that or want to be involved, please uh, come following worship on April 21st. And finally, to round out the month of April, following worship on April 28th, there will be a town hall meeting for both uh, Woodmar and First Church here in uh, the sanctuary uh, where we will talk about the merger a little bit and we will break up into smaller groups where you can express your uh, opinions, your comments, ask questions. We may not have answers for those questions, but we will uh, gather those questions together and work on putting answers together for them. And we will have several of these over the coming months. And just one last uh, reminder, um, we have noticed that when we are worshiping at, uh, at least at uh, Woodmar, the giving for First Church has been really, really low, but our bills don't go down. Um, so please continue to give no matter which church we're at. You can always drop off your offering here at the church. You can mail it in. You can give online through Tithely. <laughs> And uh, I haven't seen the numbers yet for Woodmar, but there might be a similar pattern there. Um, 
And just sort of one of those uh, pastoral words about that. If, if you are like sort of withholding your giving because you're uncertain of what's going to happen, I will say the one way to guarantee that the thing you don't want to happen will happen is to not give. <laughs> because if we wind up in worse financial situation than we are, then we have no options. So if you'd like to keep the options open, uh, please continue to give as generously as you always have. Now um, that we got all that stuff out of the way, let us uh, prepare our hearts and our minds to worship our God as Pat comes to lead us in the call to worship. Prelude, sorry. See, this just proves that we need a uh, worship committee to help keep me straight. Prelude, thank you. Please join me in the call to worship. How shall we live when shadows gather? Drawn to God's unquenchable light, we are also drawn into one another's presence. What was hidden has been revealed. We are woven together with all creation. Let us worship God, who is our light and our salvation. Please stand as you are able for the opening hymn. This is my Father's world, number 144 in the hymnal.
Please bow your heads for the opening prayer. God of abundance, we are thankful for the beauty all around us. Weave us together in a life full of goodness and joy. Help us to move in harmony with one another and with all creation. Let us travel on your path toward release in your presence. Amen. Amen. At this time, the children may come forward. All that you touch and all that you see, all that you taste, all you feel in all that you love, in all that you hate, all you distrust, all you save, in all that you give, in all that you deal, in all that you buy, beg, borrow, or steal, in all you create, in all you destroy, in all that you do, in all that you say, in all that you eat, in everyone that you meet, in all that you slight, in everyone you fight, in all that is now, in all that is gone, in all that's come to come, and everything under the sun is in tune, but the sun is eclipsed by the moon. Uh, David Gomer's awesome, come on. All right, so how are we all doing today? Good, good, good. I'm going to tell you what today is like I normally do. I am not going to tell you what to do with the day because your parents are going to be very upset with me for telling you this, okay? So parents, brace yourself. Today is National No Housework Day, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Oh, you, you like that, don't you, Maya? Yeah, okay. But I don't want to talk about today. I want to talk about, hello, Sam. You want to come over here so we can see? Because you, you might know the answer to this. What is happening tomorrow? The solar eclipse. You got to speak louder. Solar eclipse. That's right, the solar eclipse. And you know, when I was in eighth grade, I wanted to be an astronomer. And I used to study that stuff. And I'm really excited about tomorrow. But I'm really more excited about Keelan. Now, a lot of you know I have a daughter. She's away at college right now. She goes to Taylor University in Upland. And it's going to be right in the middle of the full solar eclipse. So I got a picture of this, what it's gonna kind of look like. So tomorrow about, I think, three o'clock, when it should be nice and bright outside where she's at, she's at college, it's gonna look like that. It's, the, the sun, moon is gonna come in front of the sun, completely covering it up. So three in the afternoon is gonna look like three in the morning, yes, Maya. That's right, the moon is going to go in front of the sun, just like you see there, and it's going to kind of block the sun out, so it's going to get really dark where she's at, just for, just for what, about five minutes or so, but it's going to be awesome. It's going to... Two minutes. <laughs> it's... Okay. It's, it's, it's somewhere... So some, somebody used the Bonnie Franklin song that I'm not going to mention is about the same length as the it, so, you know, but Bonnie Tyler, not Bonnie Franklin, one day at a time. Is, anyway, anyway, so Maya, it's going to be like the moon is playing hide and, or the sun is playing hide and seek with us, right? So have you, anybody here ever played hide and seek? Yes, you all played, you ever play a game called Wolf? When I was younger, we, it kind of started off at like hide and seek and then it turned into a game of tag. We used to call it Wolf. It was. That, that, that kind of sounds a little bit like Wolf. He would play at night, it was play, play hide and seek and then it turned into a game of tag. But. But anyway, so that um, brings us, to, we're going to look at a memory verse early this month. Who would like to read our memory verse for us? All right, Mia. Mia, Mia, Mia. Uh, Maya's fun. If anybody wants to try this, you could learn for yourself. I have hidden your words in my heart that I might not sin against you. Palms of... Hmm? Psalms 119.11. Very good. Yay. 
So, you know, I know that we call the Bible, you know, the Word of God, but I don't understand how I could hide it in my heart. Now, if I take the Bible, if I put it right here, is it hidden? No, no, it's not. But what if I take it and I, and I, I put it in my shawl like this? Is it hidden now? Is it? Yes. Okay. But if I take the Bible, you know, okay, so, come here, you. Lay, 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 lay down here, Sam. Now, if I take this and I go like this and I try to push, could I hide this in your heart if I do that? No, it just it might hurt a little bit, won't it? If I, if I do a little bit hard. What if, what if you ask a doctor, could you give me an opportunity? You can sit up now. And let, let, unless you want to ask the doctor, could I have an operation to put the Bible in my heart? Do you think that would work? Mm, no, and if it does, it may not be that good for us. So what do you think that it means when it says, I have hidden your word in my heart? So if we can't put the Bible in a heart like we said, what does that mean? How does God's word get into your heart? Yes, come on up here. How does, how does God's word get into your heart? She says by remembering it. Have you been reading my notes? Maybe you are. Um, because the way it gets in the heart is it gets there when we read and study the Bible every day until we know it, quote, by heart. And that just means just to know it very, very well. You know, scientists, you know, studies have shown that we must read hear or do something six times before it is in your head. So for the Bible to get from our head to our heart, we need to read the Bible each and every day. You got something to say? It looked, looked like you were motioning for No? Okay, so let's pray. Thank you, God, for your word. Help us to be faithful to read it and to keep it in our heart to be used each day in all of God's children. Say... And we already read the memory verse, so I think you guys are up next. You want us?
Amen indeed. Now as we come to our time of prayer, where we literally bear our souls to one another and to God, seeking um, each other's help and asking God to work within us, to work within those that we love and care about, to touch lives and hearts, to heal our brokenness, calm our fears, and assuage our pain. I uh, invite you to be sure to uh, keep the names that are listed in the insert in the bulletin of those on our ongoing prayer lists and those who are homebound or in residential facilities. Um, and also please uh, use the uh, cards and the pews to write down any other prayer concerns that you have. I will be going around and collecting those as we sing our prayer hymn, which is Blessed Be the Tithes That Bind, uh, which is number 557 in the hymnal. Um, so let us uh, prepare our hearts for prayer as we sing together, um, Blessed Be the Tithes. In our prayers this morning, um, let us keep in our hearts and minds the family of Jack Clee, who passed away this past Tuesday. Um, Jack used to uh, do a lot of the cooking for the men's breakfast that used to be here at First Church. Uh, and I received a call this morning from Ron Anderson to let me know that. If any of you also know Ron, um, he said that they were very dear friends, so keep Ron in your prayers especially. Nancy asks for prayers for her brother, Joe, who's uh, recovering and healing from numerous health issues. From Jim, the husband of her friend, Jerry, who is uh, healing from numerous health issues. For her friend, Charlotte, who is healing from open heart surgery. And from Deb Perryman, who has numerous serious health injuries. And uh, let us keep Nancy in our prayers, um, being close to so many people who have so much going on is uh, uh, a heavy burden to bear. And Mario and Susan would like uh, prayers uh, for not only the love of our church, as they come out of almost two years of illness, um, and they thank you everybody for the love of their uh, church family and uh, are grateful that they are so blessed. And prayers for Joanne. Also, um, I always hesitate to do this, um, but over the next few weeks, please keep me in your prayers. One, as I travel this week on vacation, but shortly after I come back from vacation, I will be having at least one minor outpatient surgery, but um, you know, it's never fun. So uh, keep me in your prayers as well. Let us take these and all of the other concerns in our heart to our Lord in prayer. 
God of love, we thank you for all that you are doing in, among, and with us. We thank you that you have gathered us together as a community, broken as we are, but still rooted in your love and love for one another. And out of the love that you share with us, and the love that we have learned at Jesus' feet, we also love one another. We have many among us who have health issues. Heal them, Lord. We have many among us who are broken in so many ways. Lord, we pray that you restore them into full relationship with you and the community. There are many among us, Lord, who struggle with various things that seem to have power over us. We pray, Lord, that we might know that you are the only true power in all of creation. We come before you, Lord, humbled by our weakness, seeking not that you make us strong, but that you make us to trust your strength. We thank you, Lord, for the love that you have shown us in your Son, Jesus Christ, and that love that we get to live out as the body of Christ in our congregations, in our communities, in our families. Help us, Lord, to be wholly yours and wholly whole. For in you, Lord, is light and life. And yet we so often fail to see, fail to live in the light. Forgive us, Lord, for our waywardness. But you, Lord, know the truth of our hearts. And you know the true person that you have created each of us to be. We thank you, Lord, for your grace. And we thank you for your spirit that enables us to grow and live into the people that you created us to be. That we might be the embodiment of Christ in this world, showing forth, living out and giving freely the love that you have given us in Christ. And so to bind us together, we pray regularly the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I now invite Pat to return to share with us the scriptures for the day. Illumination. Risen Christ, may the words we speak and the stories we hear invite us into a deeper relationship with you and with one another. Amen. Our first set of scripture can be found in Psalm 133, and it can also be found in the hymnal on page 850, and it will be read responsively. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when we live together in unity. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing of life forevermore. Our second set of scripture is found in 1 John, chapter 1 and chapter 2, verse 2. The incarnation of the word of life. 
that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Light and darkness, sin and forgiveness. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus. His son purifies us from all sin. If we proclaim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us for all unrighteous, from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you that you will not sin, but anybody, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word of God. Light and darkness. Polar opposites, right? Tomorrow, with the eclipse, we will have a situation where the source of light upon our earth will momentarily be darkened. You and I are eclipsed every day. You and I, who have the light of Christ within us, find that our own sin, our own fear, our own selfishness eclipse the light of Christ within us. The eclipse tomorrow, for me, I mean, I'm a big nerd, uh, but you don't have to be a big nerd to be excited about what that means. Uh, Sherry and I, we're going to be driving down as you know, not all the way to Indianapolis, but hoping to be down there during totality and hoping that there are no clouds obscuring the, uh, the view because it would be kind of unfortunate to drive not just a couple hours, but through what promises to be horrendous traffic to see clouds. <clears throat> I can stay home and see clouds. But you know, it's also kind of a shame that we spend every day and we spend a whole lot of time and effort and energy living behind our own clouds. In fact, we are the clouds that blocks the light. So, praise be to God that the light shines whether we block it or not. But the problem with the clouds, now let me be more direct, the problem with the sin in our lives that blocks the light of God from shining through us 
is that it blocks us from lots of other things too. Because sin, I, I don't look at sin as being a moral issue. The morality of sin is kind of just a description. Sin itself is being broken. It comes from our relationship with God being broken. And it comes from our relationship with one another being broken. And it comes from our relationship with our very selves being broken. With all these brokenness, broken relationships, we hide, we lie to ourselves. We convince ourselves that we can be in control. We convince ourselves that we know better. And we convince ourselves that, <coughs> excuse me, that we are in competition. I have to get mine. And if that means you have to do without, well, too bad. That's the way of the world, right? And my group, my group is more important than your group. And my thoughts and opinions are more right than yours. And if I can kind of get away with a little bit so that I get a little bit more, well, yay me. And through all of this, we are denying God's lordship over us. And we are failing to trust in the God who promises to provide everything for us that we need. We seek to be in the place of God. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, spends several chapters describing the various kinds of sin that people experience in the world. And he comes to what he calls the granddaddy of all sin. And the sin that he says is the source of every other sin. And that sin is pride. Now, it's a little difficult in English because the word pride means a number of different things. But the sin of pride that Lewis speaks of is the sin of wanting to be better. Not, not better like I want to be a better person. No, I want to be better than you. I want to have more than you. I deserve more than you. Pride, according to Lewis, is inherently competitive. He says that the greedy person, there's only so much money, and beyond that, more greed doesn't improve what you're seeking, unless what you're seeking is to have your pride satisfied. It's not that I have lots if I'm greedy, it's that I have more than you. And power. There's only so much power that a person can yield. But if I have more power than you, then that must mean that I am more important than you. I am more valuable than you. I am better than you. Indeed, Lewis says that the sin of the devil was pride. When the devil wanted to take God's place. The sin of Adam and Eve in the garden was pride. Because they wanted to be like God. They wanted God's power. And in all of these things, the sins of the world often they are just a good thing taken too far. But pride is at its very core the very definition of evil because it seeks to replace God with the self. 
In my wiser moments, I realize that the last thing that I want to be is God. But I don't always have wise moments. And some of my moments, I get wrapped up in things. I might feel a little insulted, a little resentful, a little hurt. I might feel a little bit like a failure. I might feel like you're going to find out how inadequate I really am. And so my pride causes me to put on a false self. My pride causes me to hide the truth of myself. And my pride can lead me to sin against you and, of course, against God in case anybody finds out that I'm actually needy that I actually need God's grace, that I am actually not perfect. Thank you for holding your gasp back. (laughs) What John's talking about in 1 John is living in the light and not in the darkness. My pride is a very dark place. And in God, there is no darkness. So to the degree that I live in my pride, in my darkness, then I have cut myself off from God. And I have cut myself off from others. It's a human condition, right? John himself said that anyone who claims to be without sin is a liar. But what do we do? John also tells us that if we confess our sins, that we are covered by God's grace. And we can take that statement at face value, but I want to kind of talk about why it works that way. Because if I confess, what have I done? I have humbled myself enough to admit that I am not God. I have humbled myself to admit that I need you. I have humbled myself enough to say I need help. Confession isn't about some sort of ritualistic act by which we beg God for forgiveness. Confession is actually the very thing that heals our brokenness. Because I cannot confess without improving our relationship. Now, the person I'm confessing to, if I'm confessing to another human being, may or may not forgive me. But I have taken a step to restore that relationship, to heal that brokenness. And when I confess to God we can know with absolute certainty that it's not us taking the first step, but God has already taken the step, opening the door for us that as soon as we choose to let the relationship be restored, Christ has already paid the price. Christ has already made the offer of grace. This light and this dark, I see it in terms of broken relationship and restored relationship. Relationships are hard. In the best of circumstances, you can just ask my wife. She'll tell you how hard it is to deal with me sometimes. But when we set our pride aside, when we confess, not just that we have done wrong, but more at the core of it, when we confess that we need each other, when we confess that we need God, then we are living in the light. Then the light can shine out then we are restored into right relationship 
And then, and then, our witness can be effective in the world. Then when people see that we have overcome our own self-inflicted brokenness, we actually have a testimony to give. When we show the world that in spite of our differences, we can come together, we have shown the world that they can too. John talks about having fellowship. And fellowship is so much more than having cookies and cupcakes in the parlor. Fellowship is about sharing our hearts, sharing our burdens, sharing our vulnerability, and sharing our brokenness. Not celebrating the brokenness, but celebrating the healing power of God in Jesus Christ. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Not because, not because we are worthy, but because we are unworthy. And because God's love is so great that He wants us to experience to see, as John says, that which we have heard, that which we have seen, that which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. In other words, we have the experience of knowing God's love. It's not just something we read in Scripture, though it's important to read Scripture. It's not just something that we hear preached, though it's important to listen to me, right? No, it's because it's something that we have heard, we have seen, we have felt, and perhaps most importantly, that we have done. Grace is about experience. God's love is about our having experienced it. Our witness to others is about sharing our experience of being broken people who have been brought back together into relationship. I thank God for the opportunity to be healed. I thank God for the love and grace of Jesus Christ that reunites us. And I thank God for what God is doing and God will do. That in spite of our brokenness, even through our brokenness, we get to be built into something new. Something that can shine God's light into our community and show people that God is here in Hammond. God is here with those Methodists. God is here even with us. Praise God. God is here. One of the ways that we experience God's love is through the meal that He invites us to. Jesus, whose body was broken and blood was spilled, invited the very people who would betray Him, deny Him, run away from Him to that first meal. And Jesus invites us to every enactment of that meal. We who betray, we who deny, we who scatter, we who are broken. Holy Communion is for us. And the very word communion means community. It means being together. It is Christ who invites us to the table. But Christ recognizes that we come to the table with our brokenness. And so he asks us 
to make ourselves right with one another and with God before coming to the table. So let us confess our sins so that we may freely come to experience his grace in the meal. Let us confess. God of grace and mercy, we want to continue singing the Alleluia's of Easter, but there are days we just don't feel like singing. Sometimes we lock ourselves away, fearful as what has happened or what the day may bring. Sometimes we allow our doubts to overwhelm our faith. Sometimes we forget about the needs of our neighbors because we are so focused on ourselves. Forgive us. Draw us back to you and to one another. Help us walk in your love and light that others may see in us the living presence of the risen Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, siblings in Christ Jesus, Christ promises that if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. Receive the hope and promise of this good news for forgiveness is ours when we forgive one another. In Christ, you are forgiven. In Christ Jesus, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And please forgive me for getting things out of order. Uh, let us now sing our communion hymn, I Come With Joy, which is number 617 in the hymnal. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. It is right to give our, um, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Right to give our thanks and praise. Creator God, you revealed to us your creation on earth. The waters flowed and the winds blew. You set the cosmos into motion and created living beings. You gave life to the plants and to the sea creatures and the land animals. You put into flight the birds and insects, and you made people to walk on the ground. You blessed us all and called us good. But when our love failed and we turned away, you revealed a love for your people and all of creation that never ends. And so we praise you with all the company of saints and sinners, singing your unending hymn. <coughs>
you continue to reveal your love for us in your Son, Jesus, who came to live among us and move as a human on this earth. When he dined with his friends just before he was to be executed, he reminded them of your love revealed in the gifts of bread and juice before them on the table. He took the bread in his hands, gave thanks to you, broke it, and shared it with his friends, saying the familiar words, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks for it, and shared it with all who gathered, reminding them, drink this, all of you. This is the cup of my covenant with you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Together we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Still creating spirit, be poured out on us gathered here and on these gifts from the field and bread and juice. As we receive them into our bodies, make us your body. Unite us with those who have come before us in your kingdom and with those who will come after us now and all. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are united by that one loaf into one people, the people of God and Jesus Christ. The bread which we break is a sharing in his life-giving gift for us. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the joyous gift of Christ's life-giving, atoning blood. Will those assisting with communion please come forward? Choir, will you please come forward?
Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. By partaking in this shared meal, may Christ's light be found in us, our fellowship with one another be strengthened, and all sin be cleansed from us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your Spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now in gratitude and thanksgiving for the meal that has been shared with us, let us now share a portion of what God has given to us to further God's work in our community. Ushers, please come forward. Generous God, as we gather to offer our tithes and offerings, we are reminded of the words of the Apostle John about the word of life. Just as your word brings light into our lives, may our giving be an act of generosity, a reflection of the abundance of your grace and love. We thank you for the forgiveness and grace offered through your Son, Jesus Christ, and as we give, May we also steward these gifts wisely for the betterment of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing as you are comfortable as we sing our closing hymn, Christ is the World's Light, number 188 in the United Methodist Hymnal.
as people seeking to keep the darkness away, to live in the light and to put aside all of the things that would keep us from the light, we have covenanted together to pray for God to break through all of those things that would block the light. So let us pray together our breakthrough prayer. O holy and mighty Redeemer, you act powerfully on behalf of your people. Our old ways no longer serve us and we feel stuck. Break through our complacency and reluctance as you reveal to us the new thing that you are doing with us. Help us to trust you. Equip us as we make our way down unfamiliar paths into the future that you are calling us to journey toward. Relieve our anxieties about our own future so that we may freely bring your loving grace to others. Amen. In the Gospel of John, we are assured that the light shines in the darkness and that the darkness cannot overcome the light. Whatever it is that separates us from God, whatever it is that separates us from one another, and whatever it is that separates us from fulfilling God's call upon our lives and God's plan for our churches, nothing, nothing can overcome the light of Christ. Seek the light of Christ. Live in the light of Christ. And even if you don't see it, know that it is there. So go in the name of God the Father, the source of the light. Go in the name of Jesus Christ, the embodiment of light. And go in the name of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the light, that we might shine that light into the world, into each other, and reflect God's love. Amen. Have a blessed week. Mm -hmm.